morning. <laughs> it should feel really good and uh, easy to come back where everyone obviously loves you. Um, but there's a certain amount of pressure. <laughs> We're expecting great things, and I'm like, okay, we'll see what happens. So, um, actually, to that end, I'd like to pray before I start. Father, we do thank you that in Jesus Christ there is fellowship that um, will not be broken by anything in this world because we are one in Christ. And we rejoice in the um, love and acceptance and support and mutual encouragement that we can have with each other through your Spirit. And yet we've gathered here today not to... um, proclaim each other, but to proclaim Jesus Christ. And so I pray that his name will be lifted up through this time together. It's in his name that we ask it. Amen. Eleven years we've been in Germany. It's hard to believe. Sometimes it feels like it's not been near that long. Sometimes it feels like we've been there way longer. Eleven years is how long Leona and I lived here as a married couple before we moved to Texas for me to finish my master's degree. So we've now spent as long in Germany as we have spent, uh, had spent here. We live in a really rural area. If you were in the earlier hour, you you heard me describe it. We're about an hour from anywhere that anybody knows of in Germany. Um, uh, When we first moved into our village, which has 300 people, we sort of noticed that they would have to change their sign from population 305 to 310 because we were there now. And we joked that they probably had more cows than people in the village. Uh, It's really a a very rural setting. Um, Shortly after we got there, we were kind of wanted to get to know our area, the woods behind our house, and it is woods behind our house for a long ways. So we took a walk. So we, we uh, being somewhat adventuresome, we, we struck out. Had no clue where we were going. We knew a little bit about the area because Leona had gone to school at the place where I now teach. But we, we, we struck out and we thought, well, we'll find out what's out there. And, and we were confident, you know. I mean, how, how bad can it be? You can't get lost here. So we're walking and it's beautiful. Beautiful summer day and um, we walked and walked <laughs> walked and walked and walked and we're not seeing anything but woods and our kids who were at that time seven nine and and twelve were kind of getting tired of walking and seeing nothing but woods and we thought well what can we do we just have to keep going we have to stay on this path that we're on and eventually we'll hit civilization or something like that Uh, but you begin to ask yourself is it worth it is you know is it worth staying on this path or do we need to do we need to find a different path to, to go on? You might be here today as a non-believer in Jesus thinking, these people talk a lot about Jesus and the way of Jesus. I wonder if it's worth being on that way. You might be thinking, is it worth while being on this way with Jesus? Or you might uh, be here as a believer and you've been on this way for a good while and you're thinking, yeah, but... Uh, not everything is, is, is like I thought it was going to be. Um, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Or it's cost a little more than I thought it was going to cost to stay on this way. Um, and here I am going on this, this path. I'm on this path of risk. Is it worth it? Is, is the risk of the Christian life worth it? Jesus actually addressed this point directly during his time on earth. And it's that text that we want to look at today. Mark chapter 10, this story actually appears in all three of the, the first three Gospels. Um, we're going to use Mark because it's a little shorter and clearer and easier to handle. And I'm going to read a little bit more through the sermon than I'm going to read right now. But the main text is Mark 10, 28, uh, where Peter says to Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake 
and for the gospel's sake, but that he shall receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Peter's comment here is that he and the disciples had left everything. Something we'll look at a little bit later on. But by and large, it's true. If you read the rest of the Gospels, any of the Gospels, you find they pretty much left everything to go follow Christ. But more important than what he says, we've left everything to follow you, is the unspoken question that he's clearly implying. Like, so is it worth it? And we left everything to follow you, Lord. What, what's the status here? Now, why would he ask that kind of a question? If you've been long in the Christian faith, you've probably asked yourself that question at some point, and you probably know why he asked the question. But why did he ask this question? And to do that, we do actually have to see a little bit more of the context. So I'm going to jump back in, Matt, in Mark 10. Uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. In, in verse 13, this thing happens where little children are being brought to Jesus. And the disciples are like, come on, Jesus doesn't have time for this. You know, keep the kids away. We got important stuff to do here. And Jesus freaks them out a little bit and says, whoa, uh, these kids need to come to me. Permit the children to come to me, um, for such is the kingdom of God. In fact, if you don't become like a kid, you can't be a part of my kingdom. So the disciples are kind of, whoa, that's not what we expected, but okay, Jesus said it, we'll do it. And then we want to pick up in verse 17. As he's setting out on a journey, Jesus was after the incident with the kids, he's setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Do you know the commandments? Or you do know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud and honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, the young man said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. And he said to him one thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But at these words, his face fell, and he went away sad, grieved, for he was one who had owned much property. A couple of observations about this young man. Young he is, we don't know how old that is, but he's, he's a young adult, and he's rich. The Bible says explicitly he had lots of possessions. He had lots of money. He had lots of stuff. He was rich. And we can, you know, it's easy, it's easy picking, so to speak, as a preacher to say, well, we're all rich today in today's world. And we are. I mean, we shouldn't deny that. Uh, we Americans, we West, uh, Western people, I say that because in Germany it's the same way. Germany is the uh, fifth largest economy in the world. Um, Germany has been voted a couple of times to be one of the top places to live in the world, that the people in Germany are uh, are happier with their living conditions than most other places in the world. We're rich. Um, But that's not the point. I mean, one thing that's a little bit unfair about that thing is it costs more to live in these kinds of cultures. Um, We couldn't make what somebody makes in the desert in Burkina Faso and live here. It just doesn't work that way. So it costs more to live here. But even so, none of us are worried about can we afford a Starbucks coffee this afternoon and still have a good dinner? And not, you know, we're not worried about that kind of stuff. So we're, we're rich, but I think it's fair to say this guy is richer than the, the normal person. He's really rich. He's got a lot. Not only that, he's an upstanding guy. He's morally good. He's um, externally religious, and he's, he's a good guy. And we shouldn't st- put that in question too, too quickly here. Um, Jesus looks at the guy and he never says, you know, you say you've kept all these laws, but we know that's not really true, come on. He, 
he accepts this guy for what he, he's a good guy. Uh, we would look at him and say, yeah, you can trust him, he's good. He would fit into our churches really well, which should scare us a little bit. But he would fit really well into our, our churches, our Western churches, our evangelical churches. In fact, we might make him an elder because he's clearly religious. He's clearly, uh, he knows the scriptures. He's moral. He's wealthy. He's a successful businessman. Isn't that the definition of what, who we make an elder? Maybe I should move on before things get a little too uncomfortable here. huh? He's a good guy. But he himself knows something is missing. Something's not right. His question to Jesus shows that at the very least, he's not sure he's got eternal life. And maybe he's not even sure about a whole bunch of other things in his life. We don't know a whole lot, but he clearly comes and he says, Lord, I've done all this stuff, but what do I need to do to get eternal life? Maybe he was trying to convince himself Maybe he wants affirmation. We don't know any of that part, but we know that something is wrong and he knows something is wrong because he comes and asks this question. He's got enough sensitivity to question his status with God. And that's a really good thing. Um, It would behoove all of us and every person alive on the face of the earth today to not assume that your relationship with God is straight. It's a good thing to question your relationship with God. It's not a good thing to go into doubt and horrendous introspection and all that, but it is good to say, what is the basis of my belief that I'm good with God? Is it a right basis, or have I made something up? Am I straight with God? And that's a good thing to ask. So he comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher, which sounds really great. Yeah, I mean, what's wrong with a greeting like that? It's respectful, um, it's nice, it's, it's polite, it's all of these kinds of things, and yet, surprisingly, Jesus rejects that. I mean, normally, somebody comes to you and, they, you know, hey, Mr. Way or, or whatever, sometimes they call me Dr. Way. Unfortunately, I'm not a, a doctor. Hopefully, I can say yet, but I'm not a doctor. But sometimes I say Dr. Way because I teach at a college, you must be a doctor, right? So, but I don't say, hey, why are you calling me doctor? I'm not a doctor. I, I just kind of overlook it and accept a polite a greeting, right? Jesus doesn't do that. Why, why can't Jesus just say, okay, yeah, I could pick at that, but let's move on to the real question. But he doesn't. He actually says, why are you calling me good? <laughs> why do you call me good? Some people have said that Jesus here is saying he's not God. God is good, Uh, no one's good but God, and you're calling me good, that's not right because I'm not really God. Um, In fact, that's the basis of um, an ancient heresy that lives on today in the teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses, that Jesus wasn't really God. And a verse that they use to support that is this verse. Clearly, Jesus says he's not God, only he doesn't clearly say that. He's pointing out that God is good, and why is this guy calling him God? There's a German Bible teacher named Adolf Schlatter who uh, was biblically faithful at a time uh, before the war when liberalism, liberal theology, was really rampant and um, raging and becoming the, the big thing in Germany. He pointed out what this, what's really going on here in this passage. He says, look at, look at what the young man knows. The young man already knows what God says about these things. He can, he can quote it. He can quote the scripture. He already knows that. He knows God's word. He comes to Jesus in the hopes that Jesus is going to give some other kind of answer. Some answer that's going to comfort him and put him to peace. Um, Maybe he's just going to reinterpret this passage so that he doesn't have to worry about the the judgment of the law. But anyway, he's coming to Jesus saying, okay, Jesus, you're, you're you're, you're the new guy in town. You're the new, new, new preacher on the scene. Do you have anything here to help me? Because I'm struggling with what the Bible says, so can you help me out here? And so when he does that, he's elevating Jesus to a position of authority, but not to the position of God, but rather to an authority who has some kind of right to judge what God has already said. 
give me a different answer. Can you, can you clarify the Bible differently for me, Jesus? Because I don't really like what it's saying, or at least it makes me uncomfortable. And that, I, don't, I like to be comfortable, and I definitely want to be sure about where I'm going. So can you explain this in a different way? And Jesus will have none of it. Jesus doesn't want to be elevated to a different authority than God or something that's set over against the Scripture. In fact, Jesus' answer points the man straight back to God and to the Scriptures. He says, you know what the Scriptures say? Almost like, why are you asking me? You know what God already said. What else do you expect from me? And if his answer has anything to do with himself and his status before God, it's something like, I'm not really sure you get what you're saying here. You're, telling, you're calling me good, but you're trying to get me say something, to say something other than what God has already said, and that wouldn't be good. Nobody who says something other than what God has already said is good. So that's not a reason to call me good. In fact, I am good. In fact, I am better than you realize I am. Um, I am good because I am God. I and the Father are one. And if you're calling me good without recognizing that, then you're making me to something other than God, a competition to God, and that's not what I am. So why are you calling me good? Which is another good question we should ask ourselves. Why do you call Jesus good? Is it because you see him as actually good or because you see him as that which can fulfill your wishes? So he, 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 he doesn't say all of that, Jesus doesn't. He just says, why are you calling me good? And so the rich man asks then what he, what he has to do to inherit eternal life. Now, like good evangelicals, we want to jump on the fact that he says, what do I have to do to, eternal, uh, to gain eternal life? It's, it's all about grace. It's not about works. And of course, those are all true statements. Um, there's nothing wrong with picking at that. The only thing is, that's not what the text is focusing on here. So if we focus on that, we're going to miss what the, te- miss what the text is actually saying. Uh, the text doesn't jump there right away, and we probably shouldn't either. Jesus' Jesus's answer is, keep the law. Keep the law. And he quotes six of the commandments, the ones that have to do with loving your neighbor. Uh, the ones, you know, don't kill your neighbor. You should love him. Don't kill him. You should love your neighbor, don't have sex with his wife. You should, you know, these are the ones that he names. And the guy says, I've, I've done all that. And again, we could bit, get really picky theologically. Yeah, well, come on, you didn't really do all that. Nobody can keep all that perfectly from youth on. But again, that's not the point of the passage. Jesus accepts him at his word there. He, he notices how serious this guy is, and he's moved with compassion. He loves him, the text says. I think he sees in this guy the image of God trapped in a cage of his own making, namely a golden cage of wealth. And he knows what the real problem is, and it's why he didn't mention the first four commandments when he said keep the law. Because the real problem is that this guy has kept a lot of external laws and probably in a very good, truly externally moral way, but he doesn't love God. He doesn't love God more than anything else. But Jesus doesn't directly say, so um, do you love God more than anything else also? Uh, Because he knows that the guy is halfway religious and any, or pretty religious actually, but any halfway religious Jew is going to know that the right answer is, yes, of course I love God with my whole heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And so they're going to give the right answer. But it's not the true answer of their life. Tim Keller has said, if you want to find out what somebody's idol is, you don't say, what do you love? Or what are you living for? Because they don't know, probably. Or they won't admit it. So what you ask is, what's the thing in your life which if you didn't have, you would feel like life isn't worth living anymore? It's just really not worth being on this road anymore. What is the thing in your life that you couldn't live without? Jesus already knows what it is in this guy's life, and he knows it's not God. Not the God. And so he goes straight to the heart of the matter, and he says, here's what you have to do. Sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me, and you'll have riches in heaven. 
and the man goes away sad. The man thinks, that's, that's too much risk. You're asking me to give up everything I've ever hoped in. You're asking me to give up my security. You're asking me to give up my importance. These are the things that make me who I am. You want me to give that up in the hope that you're going to give me eternal life that I can't yet see? You want me to risk everything hoping that maybe you got the truth. Now we see that the guy didn't really think that Jesus was all that good after all. But that's side point. It was too much risk. Now, you can't talk about this passage without asking a couple of theological questions because we do know a lot of the scriptures and we're, we, you know, it, how do we fit this in with the things we know? Is Jesus requiring here a works righteousness? Is he saying, you know, if you do this, then you will have worked your way to heaven. Then, then I'll reward you with salvation because you've done the right work. No, that's not what he's doing. What he's doing is using the law to do exactly what the law is supposed to do. What is the law supposed to do? The Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, are there to show you where your sin is, where your false gods are, what's wrong with you and why you need a salvation that's bigger than keeping any law. And Jesus is using the law to point exactly that out in this man's life. He's not requiring a works righteousness. He's showing him that he's sinful and needs to be saved. Does Jesus' requirement extend to all of us? Do we all have to go out and sell everything that we have? And here's where we immediately want to say, no, no, not, that's not what Jesus means. Jesus means to be willing to sell it all. Only he didn't say that. We really want to jump quickly to some other explanation of what this actually means. This makes us really uncomfortable. Jesus doesn't say, be willing to give it all up if I asked you to. Jesus says, I'm telling you, go do it. What do we do with that? I suspect that we're content to be willing because we know that God's not going to really talk to us and say, hey, go out, sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and then you can go on being my disciple. We know that's not going to happen. And so we can say, well, I'm willing if God would ask knowing he's never going to ask, not in the way that I know he's asking. So it's easy to say we need to be willing to do that. And I wonder how, much really, how many of us really are willing to do that. Maybe the fact is that we love our riches more than we love God, and that's why it's easy to say, yeah, Jesus really just means to be willing. Because we don't have to really test what we love here. I think there's another way that we lose the force of Jesus' words when we, when we too quickly turn this into a symbol of whatever your idol is. Now, Jesus does expand the meaning of what he's saying, and I think that that's a legitimate application. I'm going to mention it again in a minute. But it's important to notice here that Jesus doesn't go to symbolic here. He talks about wealth. Wealth is a problem, Jesus says. Yeah? Riches are a problem. And I know that's unpopular in Western culture, in Western Christianity today, but Jesus camps on this for a bit. Let me read you the next couple of verses. Mark 10, 23. So the man goes away, sad, because he's got a lot of stuff, and Jesus, looking around, says to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it will be for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Yeah, I mean, like, astonished. Whoa, whoa, Jesus, you, you just blew our minds here. How can you say such a thing? I mean, in the Old Testament, we have scripture that says God blesses the people who are obedient. The, the people that God is pleased with, he blesses them with wealth. So what are you talking about here? And Jesus notices their amazement, and he answers again and said, Ah, just kidding, guys. You just have to be willing to give it up. Nope. He says, children. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. 
It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? And Jesus looks at him and says, well, nobody with men. You're you're right, nobody can. With men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, all things are possible with God. I can even save a rich man for whom it is extremely difficult to be saved because he trusts so much in his wealth in ways that he doesn't necessarily even know that it's very difficult for him to decide to love God more than anything else. Jesus really talks a lot about wealth not just here but in all of the Gospels. And basically what he's saying here is when the blessing of God becomes more important than the blesser, than the God who blessed, then something's wrong. Then then you're entrapped. When the gift becomes more important than the giver, then the gift has become a slave driver. And so he talks a lot about the fact that people who are wealthy are trapped. They're, They're slaves. They look like they're the free ones because they have money to do whatever they want, but they are the slaves. This is hard. This is hard for the disciples to hear, and it's hard for us to hear. It actually ought to make us uncomfortable. If it makes us comfortable and we can too easily explain it away, then we probably haven't actually heard what Jesus has to say. And I'm not talking just to supporters of the poor missionary. I'm talking to the missionary who lives a pretty good life for being a missionary. We have a lot. Are we, are we actually giving it away? Um, but I'm off track. Despite the focus on the, on, the, on the wealth, I do think that it's appropriate to apply this to whatever. Uh, anything that you love more than God will enslave you. It will be your slave driver. You won't be free, and it will be difficult for you to get into the kingdom of God, as Jesus says because it will be hard for you to confess that as a sin and to trust in Christ for forgiveness and indeed to get into heaven. The concreteness of the answer, however, stands. It's not just be ready to kill your idol, whatever your idol is, it's do it. Take specific actions to kill the thing that you love more than God. Give stuff away. If wealth is your idol, start giving it away. Start giving it away. Just give it away. Nope, I don't want it to trap me. Just give it away. If it's sex, stop whatever, you, you <clears throat> whatever you're doing in that area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stop whatever you're doing. Sacrifice things that might be okay, but you know are going to lead you down a path. Watching television, does that lead you to a further path of something? Where, then quit watching television. Is that a law? Is it a sin? No, it's not a sin or a law but it's a thing that you give up to attack the idol that's enslaving you in your life. Is it power? Go serve somebody. Unknown. Yeah? Serve somebody. Because you need to kill your idol or it's going to kill you. But it doesn't stop there. Um, there's a promise. And it's the answer to the question that we, st- we posed at the beginning of the sermon and that Peter actually asks here. And it's in, we find it here in the verses that we read earlier. Verse 28, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we've left everything and follow you. And Jesus says, Truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but he shall receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children. He doesn't say father probably because we have the Father. So he doesn't say fathers um, and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So so Peter is probably thinking, okay, I I need to get something straight here with Jesus because I thought the kids shouldn't come and Jesus says the children should come. In fact, he says, yeah, I got to be like a kid to get into heaven. And then I thought, the rich guy, for sure, he's going to make it. And Jesus says, he doesn't have a chance. So 
Okay, wait a second, Lord. Um, me, you know, I and, and the other disciples here, we pretty much left everything. Where do we stand with you? What, what's the deal here? Is there something for us? We've, we have risked everything. Is it worth the risk? We're on this path here with you, and things are, yeah, they're exciting. Some awesome things are happening, but there's also some things we're kind of freaked out about, and you keep talking about dying and all that. What is the deal with us? Where do we stand? And a lot of times when Peter asks the question, you see a problem. <laughs> you see a problem right off. And some people have picked at this question here. Yeah, I see Peter's out for stuff for him. This is the first time in Mark that Jesus does not rebuke the disciples for their question. This is a good question. It's not that we should blindly follow Jesus with no hope or idea of what might come. It's okay to ask, Lord, um, are you for real? I mean, is this a real thing? Is it good to follow you? Is it, is it safe to follow you? I mean, it may not be safe in this world, Jesus says, but is, what's the payoff here? Are we going to get anything for this, or are we going to give up everything and just die, and there's nothing? And Jesus gives him a great answer. He says, there's nothing that you could give up here that I won't in some fashion or another replace. Yes, there's going to be persecution. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not like there's no risk and that there's no pain. There will be pain. In fact, I guarantee you, you'll be persecuted, which is probably another thing we should remember when we feel like uh, people in the world don't like us in our views. Well, Jesus said that would happen. Hello. You, you, you're, you're talking against the idols of the world. You think they're going to like that? Of course they're not going to like that. And if they're in power, they're going to make laws against you. You're going to be persecuted. That's, that's a fact. He says, but the, this other stuff, whatever you can give up, um, you're going to get something in kind back. And when you die, eternal life. That's not to be dismissed, but interestingly, that's not quite the focus here. But it is the ultimate thing. No matter what I have to suffer in this life, eventually, I will pass out of this life, and that won't be the end, and I won't have given up all kinds of possible goods for nothing. I will have eternal life. I will be with Jesus Christ in the presence of God. But what about this other stuff? You give up lands, you give up family, and so on. In this life, Jesus says you'll get it back. Five years ago, my mother died, and I was in Germany when she died, and I didn't get back for the funeral. And I'm not complaining because God graciously enabled me to come back a few weeks before we were sure that she was going to die soon, and we had a blessed time of fellowship. And she knew it was the last time she'd see me on this earth, and I knew it was the last time I'd see her on this earth. But nonetheless, I was gone when it happened. I wasn't with the rest of my family when they were doing, going through grieving. I'm not going to get a mother back. I'm, I'm not going to get my mother back in this life. You have one mother, you know, and if, 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 you, if she leaves you because you're following Christ or if she dies, you're not going to get her back. I mean, yes, she might come to Christ and so on, but basically, so what I'm saying is Jesus' words have to be here have to be understood at least a little bit metaphorically because clearly a one-to-one -one correspondence just doesn't work. Is that fair? I think it is fair. Uh, all through the Gospels, Jesus points out the fact that your blood family is actually not necessarily the closest thing to you when you're a follower of Christ. His own family, his blood family, his, his, his half-brothers, sons of Mary uh, and Joseph, he's the son of Mary, son of God, his half-brothers and his mother come, the one who brought him into the world. They come because they're concerned about him. They, they're hearing that he's working like a maniac, and they're worried that maybe he is a maniac. And so they're standing outside this place where he's teaching, and somebody says, hey, Jesus, your family's out here. And Jesus said something that's crass. He says, well, who's my family? My family are the people who do the will of God. So Jesus, when he was to some extent neglected by his family, said, I got another family. You know? And he said that different times, different 
uh, in different situations, he implied that there's a different family of people who follow Christ in the service of God who have actually a tighter relationship than you do with your blood family. I'm not dissing family. Family is important. The Bible emphasizes responsibility to family. I'm not saying family is not important, and in no way am I excusing people who go into the ministry and work so hard in the ministry that they neglect their responsibility to their family, and their family ends up going to hell, not because um, they rejected Christ, but because their dad rejected them in favor of Christ. That, that's a different problem. Yeah? What I'm saying is that Jesus is saying, you can forsake your blood family and I got something else for you. And it's, it's just as fulfilling and satisfying as what you think you gave up. Yeah? So, so there's that. What about lands? I mean, here he's telling this guy to give up all this stuff that he has. And, here he, and then he turns around and says, but if you give up farms and lands, I'll give it back to you. I think here also it's fair to say, just like you, you don't get your mother back, you get, you get back that which you thought you were giving up when you gave up your lands. You get provision. You get blessings you never even dreamed that you might experience if you give up everything. And many people throughout church history can testify to this. I preached, um, I guess it's fair to say this, I preached this sermon last week in German in our church there. And um, right afterwards, they had a testimony time, which is a little bit unusual, but they had a testimony time, and three, I thought, this is going to go nowhere, a testimony time. Three people got up like this and said, you know what? One was a, a, a fellow person in full-time ministry and said, when we started out, we thought, what are we doing? We're giving up this, this, and this. We've experienced so much blessing and provision from God, we've never lacked a thing. My testimony is, yep, I gave up a job where I was pay, paid almost twice as much as what I make as a missionary. Um, wasn't rich in, in worldly terms, but it was sure a lot better in, in those terms than what we're making now. We've never lacked. We never thought, hmm, what are we going to do for supper tonight? Uh, give it to the kids. I'll, I'll just fast tonight because we don't have enough for everybody. Never had that. Not once. We had car problems galore and seen God provide for cars, car repairs. What I thought we were giving up and gave up, in a sense, yes, God has taken care of. He's given way more than I would have ever expected God could give. Jesus says, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I think I don't want to go back and change the meaning of that. I don't think that what he was pointing out at the beginning is what we should apply here. But there is a sense in which, a sense in which yeah, Jesus is good, and he's going to be good to you when you follow him. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to give up everything to follow Christ? The answer of the Bible and the answer of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of Christians through church history is, it is. It's worth it. Um, I had thought, thought at one point to sing that song from Andrew Peterson, Is He Worthy? It has a different focus, so I decided not to do it after all. But, but the question applies here. Is, is he worth it? Is he worthy? Is, is he worth giving up all the things that I think are so crucial to my life? And the answer of the scriptures and the answer of that song and the answer of me and the answer of many other people is yes, it is worth it. So a couple thoughts to close. Number one, it costs something in this life to follow Jesus. In light of the promises that Jesus has given here, you might say that the, the risk is only felt because Jesus ends up giving you back everything you thought you were going to be missing. But nonetheless, it is felt. At the time, the costs are paid because the promises are experienced, the fulfillment of the promises is experienced later. And some of it, not even until we die. The eternal life part, you don't, you know, you don't see that until later. So there is a, a, a risk and there's a felt loss. In fact, I think when Jesus says in other passages, if you don't die to yourself, 
you can't follow me. I think part of what he means is this. It feels to you like you're giving up the most crucial things in your life because you're saying, I want to love God more than anything else, and I want to follow Christ more than anything else. And it feels like a loss. The risk comes first, and then comes the payoff. And I wonder sometimes if we're selling and buying a perversion of the gospel, that Jesus simply wants to be your friend. Jesus wants to be there by you and make you successful in all the things you want without you ever changing anything about the way you think or the desires of your heart or asking yourself, do I love God more than anything else? We, we want to present Jesus as this nice guy um, who comes alongside and, and when you need him, he's there, but otherwise he kind of just stays in the background. Surely you've heard of the, uh, the term that's gone around now for a couple of decades, I think. Um, some folks did a, a study and came up with the, the view of God of the average American, I think it was an American youth at the time. And the term that they gave to this view is moral therapeutic deism because uh, the view of God that most church people hold is God wants you to live a good life, moral. He's there to help you out when you're sad. It's therapeutic. Otherwise, he stays out of your way. He's deistic. Uh, He sets things kind of going, but then he steps back. Moral therapeutic deism. And that's what we think about Jesus a lot. Sometimes that's how we present Jesus. Jesus says, you want to follow me? You got to kill the thing that's standing between you and God. You kill it. Sell everything you have if it's wealth. And then you can come follow me. It costs something to follow Christ. Um, but the second thing is it's worth it. Jesus is worth it. He, he is good. His promises are true. He holds himself to his promises, and he's good, and he's worth it. And I think that that has to be the focus of our discipleship. Otherwise, it turns into, indeed, a form of strict uh, religious kind of living that has no life to it. It's just, this is what I'm supposed to do, so I do it. But where's the promise? Where's the, where's the grace? Where's the good stuff that God is and that we proclaim that he is? Jesus is good. He's worth it. And then a third thought, because I'm a missionary and I need to say something about missions, not just because I have to because I'm a missionary, but because I've given my life to missions and I believe in missions. Missions is definitely not the only application. And I know missionaries love to preach on this passage and so we think, oh, that's a missions passage. No, no it's not. It's a following Jesus passage. Um, but missions is most certainly an application of this. And at least in Germany, we don't talk near enough about it, which is why I brought it out last week in, in our church there. Um, maybe for you, God wants you to actually, in a more concrete, more obvious way, give up things that other people can, can have in their lives, and you give it up because you have to go somewhere else, to some other land, to some other culture, to some other, some other situation in order to preach Christ to people, in order to develop people into followers of Jesus Christ. Maybe that's what your part is. Years ago, we used to say, um, you you have no right to stay unless you've at least considered whether or not God wants you to go. Some things that we said years ago weren't all that good. That one's good. Have you ever considered go? This is a problem I see in Germany. It's a thing that we're starting in the school and in our church to more directly address. People grow up, Um, A very good thing in the schools there is that early on you get put into practical work situations uh, so you kind of see where do I want to go with my life and you end up in a good place, hopefully. But, um, of course, it's completely secular. So nobody ever says, do you think maybe God wants you to be in full-time ministry for the church uh, here in Germany, here, uh, here somewhere else? I mean, here in America, maybe they send a missionary to America or whatever. Um, no one ever asked the question. And unfortunately, in the church in Germany, they're not asking the question very much either, which, just as a side note, contributes to our student recruitment problem. Nobody's being challenged to go into the ministry. What about you? Should you go? Should you go for a while, maybe? 
should you, should you go? Another thing we said years ago that was good is that everybody has a part in missions, and if you don't go, you're supposed to be sending and praying. In fact, the truth is, even if you do go, you're supposed to be sending and praying. So we support missionaries also. Um, but if you haven't gone, are you sending? Are you giving? Are you praying for missionaries? They need your prayer, and that I can tell you from experience. They need your prayer for their spiritual lives. They need the prayer for the effectiveness of their ministry because they can do all they want, and if God's not working, it's wasted effort. Pray for your missionaries. Give to missions. And how do you support missions through your work? How do you live missions through your work? Do you know that every valid work is a way of living out what God wants to happen in this world? Are you living missions through your work, or is it such something you do to make money so you can do other stuff? Are you living missions in your work? This is a, also a challenge for churches, because if people give up family, and Jesus says, don't worry, I'll give it back to you, where is that? It's the church. Are you being the kind of church that when people give up family to follow Christ, they haven't lost anything because they got you? Yeah? Are, are, are you that kind of a church? Are you becoming that kind of Are you striving for that kind of, to be that kind of a church? And then the last point is maybe you, like I have been, I will just confess here, in the last six months or so, in a place of, of questioning. Um, I don't want this to go all personally emotional, but just a couple things to, to kind of clue you in. A, that missionaries aren't superhero Christians, um, and B, what we personally have been dealing with, this is partly missions report. Uh, we've, we've had, I think we both uh, have had some, some questions about what we're doing. It's not, is it worth it? Yeah, maybe, it worth, is it worth it in the sense of are we, are we accomplishing anything? Are we, are we doing anything? Churches have, uh, even free churches, have a, part, a, a hard time preaching word-based messages. Um, and in 10 years, we're kind of like, well, at least in our church, we still see that as a problem. Are we, are we having any effect in what we're doing? Uh, do, people, do people who graduate from our school approach ministry with a, a better theological grounding than they would have had they not been there? And sometimes we think, I don't know. What about their spiritual lives? Are they built up in our, to the point where they're able to, to function? Um, obviously, you always function in conjunction with the body, but are they able to function as leaders of the body in their own spiritual lives? And sometimes we look at graduates and we think, ah, I don't know. We have a lot of work to do there. And then you think, you know what? I gave up a really good paying job with a future and a career ladder to do this. And, and my kids have had to put up with a weak church through their teenage years. And I missed my mom's funeral, and I missed my dad's funeral. And I'm not there with my family when they're going through these things, and is it worth it? And these questions are not theoretical, and they won't be theoretical for you if they haven't already become non-theoretical. Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Jesus says it is. He says it is. Whatever you've lost, <laughs> I'll provide it for you. I'll provide it for you in kind, in spades. And you know what? When you die, you get everything. You'll be with me. You'll have eternal, rich life. He's good, and that's the takeaway. He's good, and it's worth following him. And I've already given testimony to the fact that we, yes, I've been through periods of questioning, and yet always in the back of my mind during the questioning is, of course it's worth it. Of course it's worth it. Because Jesus is who he said he was. And he gives what he said he gives. And yes, there's tough times and so on, but Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one. I never did finish the story at the beginning. Obviously, we found our way out of the woods or we wouldn't be here today. We walked and walked and walked and walked, and finally we find a village. And we think, oh, how far away are we from our home? Turns out it's the next village around the bend. 
um, we weren't very far at all. Hadn't lost all that much after all. It was worth it staying on the path. Had we gone some other path, who knows where we would have ended up. It was worth it. What about Peter? He's the one asking the question here. Did he, would he say it was worth it? Well, the book of Second Peter is the very last book that we have from him, the last hearing that we have of him, probably written not too long before he died as a martyr following Christ. And he writes in chapter 3 of Second Peter, no, he says, this, this is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and, and Savior spoken by your apostles. And then at the end of the chapter, in verse 17, he says, you therefore, beloved, knowing all this beforehand, be on your guard lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. It doesn't sound here like at the end of his life he's saying, man, did I make a big mistake. He's saying, you know what? I've lived this. I'm standing before the end here, and I'm telling you, don't forget it. Keep on growing in grace. That sounds to me like he found out that Jesus gives back everything you think you give up when you follow him. And that's what I would hope that we would all experience. Will you follow the good Jesus, forsaking everything else that's, that seems too good, too important to give up? The risk seems great, but the reward is greater.